All right. All right. Welcome, everyone, to this week's Autonomy Talks. This is a great pleasure this week to have uh, with us Professor Cynthia Sung, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics and a member of the GRASP Lab at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, something about Cynthia, she obtained a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Rice University, and she then moved to MIT, where she obtained a PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Her research interests are uh, in computational methods for design automation of robotic systems, with a particular focus on origami-inspired and compliant robots. Uh, as you can see, she, have, she has won several awards, among which uh, I mentioned the NSF Career Award. And today she's going to talk about computational design of compliant dynamical robots. This is a topic that exactly falls within the scope of this, uh, this seminar series. And therefore, I'm very excited to, to hear more about it. So without further ado, Cynthia, the stage is yours. Go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to share the work that my group is doing. Um, I'm going to share some of the ideas that we've been thinking about in computational design. Um, and uh, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt. I'm happy to uh, discuss the things that you all are interested in. So uh, to get started, I'm going to start with uh, the motivating example for our lab, which is really the idea that we want to make creating custom robots easier for whoever wants one, right? So there's, uh, so imagine in the future that you want some sort of robot, maybe in this case, you have some idea in your mind of a crawly robot that you want uh, to move around on some rough terrain and you want to create this physical design to move around in this physical space, well, right now, you would have to be an experienced robotics engineer, right? And you would have to be able to design all of the subsystems associated with creating this robot and fabricating it and then getting it to uh, be controlled uh, and move around in your space. We're interested in seeing whether we can automate this process. So the idea is that in the future, you might be able to take your concept and then um, input those ideas into some sort of software that will help you make the design decisions that are required to get this robot working, right? And because the software takes into account engineering constraints such as geometry, fabrication, kinematics, control, et cetera, then it can help you also to fabricate this robot and have it very quickly moving around in the space that you want. So the question that we're primarily concerned with in my group is, well, what exactly goes into this sort of system, right? And so if we really want to think about this kind of problem, um, there are a lot of elements that go into this problem, right? So the first question is, how do we actually represent the robot? And normally, you can kind of represent the robot as some sort of graph, right? So we can say that the robot consists of some sort of kinematic structure. It has links, which have geometry, inertia, it has joints, which have degrees of freedom, range of motion. It has a controller associated with it, it has sensors, right? Um, actuators, etc. And this is a representation that I assume many of you are already familiar with because it's basically the representation that people use in URDFs or a lot of common um, uh, when, when they try to simulate robots like these. In addition, if we want to be able to design a robot for a particular scenario, we need to be able to represent the task, right? And so the task consists of some sort of environment, um, which might have geometry, but it also has other uh, physical quantities like friction, or you know, if you're trying to manipulate an object, some sort of mass or something associated with the object, um, and an objective, right? Which is some sort of function that um, represents the robot's performance, right? So if I'm trying to get the robot to move around in a space, this might be the robot's error from a desired trajectory. It might be the robot's ability to uh, pick up an object of a certain mass, that sort of thing. And at the end of the day, right, the problem that we're trying to solve is this one, right? It's an optimization problem where we're trying to say, we want to maximize this objective F over the space of possible robot designs subject to physics, right? So this here is a very simple version, right? Of the very complicated uh, problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and we can try to tackle this problem in a lot of different ways. So one of the methods that um, 
I worked on during my PhD was trying to think about, well, what if the robot um, is a legged robot, is performing quasi-static uh, tasks? And uh, in order to solve this problem, well, let's uh, not use, uh, let, let's ask, ask the uh, human engineer for some help. And so we designed this uh, interactive software, uh, which we called Robogami, which basically consisted of this uh, click and drag interface where people could drag parts in, these parts had geometry, they had mass. When they were um, connected to each other, this system kept track of the kinematic chain associated with this, uh, with this robot and was able to suggest a controller associated with it that allowed it to move forward on some sort of flat ground. Um, what we did in this case was we associated the parts uh, that this user was manipulating with a fabrication plan so that very quickly, if they were happy, if the user was happy with the design that they saw in the virtual, virtual space, they could also print out the design and have the same design moving around on their desk. And of course, we're not the only people to have worked on things like that. Um, there are other examples of software that uh, people have uh, created. What you're seeing on the bottom left is from Stellion Koros's group, who's uh, also at ETH. I know uh, Andrea has also been working on a lot of ideas very similar to this. And so, Basically, you can create these representations for robots that um, allow you to uh, simulate them, to create custom uh, morphologies, and to be able to uh, figure out how the controller interacts with the physical design, how it relates to the actuators and sensors, et cetera. And if you're interested in you know, getting the robot to try to uh, if you're interested in getting the computer to try to uh, design the robot from scratch without any human input, um, there are people who have been working on that too. And actually these ideas um, go back uh, decades. So what you're seeing here is an example from um, Todd Lipson from 2000, where basically uh, also a graph representation of a robot plus actuator, sensors, et cetera, um, was used along with a genetic algorithm in order to evolve these sorts of robot designs. So, um, oh, so like I said, this was uh, one of the results that um, I worked on during the course of my PhD. And at the time, we were very happy with it because we said, well, look at what is, look at the interesting space of robot designs that can be created. Um, now, if someone wants to create a custom legged robot, well, they can do it, right? And we can help them to do it by making a lot of the engineering decisions automatically for them. One of the main pieces of feedback we got though, was that, well, a lot of these robots that, you, that, you, that are generated from the software look like toys, right? So, I mean, you can fancy up the mesh and you can make it look nicer. You can use better motors, you can use better sensors. But at the end of the day, um, a lot of the design software that is used in order to create these sorts um, in, in, in this field uh, make a lot of assumptions that restrict the types of tasks that these robots can perform. So if I was to compare the robot that came out of the Robogami software right, that, we, uh, that, that we wrote to another legged robot, this is one that's right next door to our lab in Dan Kodacek's lab, then you can see there's a very large difference in how these robots are moving, right? The one on the left, um, it's able to propel itself forward, but it's basically um, uh, limited. This one in particular is limited to flat ground. I mean, potentially you could design it for more complicated scenarios, but the one on the right, you're seeing a lot of dynamical motions. You're seeing much, uh, you will, you, if you measured, you would see better energy efficiency. Um, and in general, um, it has an ability to address a wider range of tasks. So if we want to be able to design more complicated robots, uh, one of the things that we realized was that we need to be able to consider how to design a robot's ability to manipulate energy, right? And, and so the major difference between these two is the robot on the right is, is uh, doing this energy manipulation. And you know, most of you are probably also familiar with models for that sort of motion, right? So there's the slip model where basically we can model the robot uh, as uh, 
as uh, converting uh, potential to kinetic energy and, and executing this motion, right? And this is a model that is used in robotics, but is also a representative of a lot of biological creatures. And so basically, since this, uh, since I've started as uh, at Penn, one of the things that my group has been very interested in is not only how do we think about computational robot design, right? Like how do we think about taking a task and converting it into a robot using algorithms, but how do we do this for dynamical robots? And in particular, how do we think about how the robots compliance affects their ability to manipulate energy, right? And so the major themes that my group works in are uh, starting with computational robot design, but we've started to also think very deeply about compliant mechanisms and how we can look at the variations in stiffness or damping or other mechanical uh, quantities that are associated with different types of uh, compliant designs. We're very interested in how we can take advantage of compliant uh, designs in order to create reconfigurable structures or structures that can adapt, right? So robots that are not necessarily just designed for a particular task, but can either change their morphology, change their stiffness, or change something about their design so that they can be better suited to different tasks that they might encounter. And in addition, um, one of the major fabrication techniques that we used and apply to all of these ideas is origami inspired design. So we're interested in thinking about how we can take advantage of sheet like materials, um, the inherent compliance that comes with bending and stretching of these sheets in order to design or in order to, to fabricate these sorts of robots. And at the same time, give us the ability to directly embed electronics, uh, actuation, sensing, et cetera, into the robot body. <clears throat> so combining all of these ideas, the big question that we've been primarily interested in then is how can we more formally think about how we design compliance in order to enhance the capabilities of robot designs. So I'm not going to talk about all of our work, um, but I am going to focus on a couple of papers that uh, where we've been thinking about these ideas. And um, like I said, if you all have any questions, I'm happy to expand or um, and, and also uh, focus on things that you all are interested in and, and get get some discussion going. So one of the first places that um, we started when we're thinking about, okay, how do we design a compliant mechanism, right? Many of you have probably heard about topology optimization, right? And so this is one of the places where we said, well, maybe we can take advantage of topology optimization approaches in order to help us design robots. So I'm just gonna give a quick overview real quick for, for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with this idea. Basically, the idea behind topology optimization is that you have some objective again, but in this case, your objective is usually some sort of uh, force from you know, the response of whatever it is you're trying to optimize, the strain energy stored inside of that structure or something like that. And what we are trying to optimize in this case, typically is some sort of material, the material block, right? So we have a block of material and at each voxel inside of this, um, this block, we can assign whether there is material or there isn't, or in some cases we can assign a material density, right? So we're designing over this space. And when you specify that design, then the, the block of material is going to respond to a certain force input in a particular way. So like very similarly to the optimization problem I showed you before, this is sub, we're minimizing our objective over the space of, mater, of material blocks subject to physics. In this case, the material deformations can be computed as some sort of energy minimization, um, assuming a quasi-static scenario. And Typically, we also add some fabrication constraints. So in this case, we want to keep the volume under a certain value. Um, you might also add other fabrication constraints like minimum thickness of material if you want to make sure the thing isn't going to fall apart, et cetera. Right? And so there's been a lot of work on topology optimization for, for example, static structures. And so if you try to apply these ideas to 
different scenarios, you can get results that look like what you see on the bottom right. So the one on the left is uh, optimization for a bridge. We start out with a rectangular block of material, point load um, uh, located in the middle. And the idea here is to minimize the compliance of the bridge. On the right, um, you see a similar scenario where instead of a bridge, there are forces being applied uh, radially. And what you get is this real life structure, right? So there exist methods for being able to solve these types of optimization problems, typically using some sort of you know, gradient descent based on some sort of uh, differentiable simulator, right? And so we were interested in thinking about whether or not these sorts of ideas would also transfer to robots, because a lot of the examples that we saw were for these sorts of static structures. So at the same time, uh, we were trying to think about, well, what would be a really interesting uh, scenario to apply these ideas to? And one of the most dynamical systems we could think of were aerial vehicles. So the inspiration for the project I'm about to show you was a hybrid aerial vehicle. And we were trying to think about, well, Hybrid aerial vehicles, you try to combine the best of uh, multi-copter robots, which are very maneuverable, very agile, but very energy inefficient, and fixed wing aircraft, which can travel long distances, but can't hover in place. And at the same time, we also saw this uh, demonstration of this quadrotor that could fold in its arms in order to get through small spaces. And so my student, Jessica said, well, what could be really fun um, is if we were able to do some sort of similar reconfiguration in order to create some sort of morphing hybrid aerial vehicle, but I wanna do it passively and I wanna do it using a compliant mechanism. And maybe this is an interesting scenario in which we can use topology optimization. So the idea that we came up with was, here's our system. What you're seeing here is a ring, which represents you know, the, where the propellers of the quadrotor are, um, are placed. And in this case, the bars over here are basically where the wings are attached. And we said, well, what we wanna do is be able to switch between modes without having to add any additional actuation to the structure. We wanna just use the propellers that are used for flight. And what this means is that we need to take, we definitely need to take advantage of the dynamics of the vehicle in order to create this switching behavior. And so the problem that we wanted to solve was, well, let's say we put a mass in the middle of the vehicle and we allow the vehicle to accelerate. We want certain types of acceleration to get the vehicle to switch modes so that we can transition between these two different flight modes. So the problem associated with uh, this design problem basically looks something like this. And this is basically the same as the optimization problem that I just showed you, that in that case was for a static block of material, but in this case is for our particular robot design. And so we formulated this optimization problem here. In this case, the objective that we wanted to um, uh, minimize was, or uh, was, um, the reaction forces from the robot that are required in order to get it to switch. And we also added um, some additional uh, compliance-based uh, objective in order to minimize the weak points in the structure so that it wouldn't fall apart and we could 3D print it. We um, added uh, limitations on what kinds of forces could, were allowed to uh, show up inside of our force displacement curves subject to uh, our actuation constraints and gravity. And when we did that, starting with a material block that looks like this, we ended up um, with this uh, shape beam, which um, we were able to then 3D print and then check the force displacement curve of. So these beams, when you um, place four of them together around the central panel and then you displace the panel uh, in the middle, then you get this resulting force displacement curve. And you can see it's a bistable curve, which is what you would want in this scenario. Because basically what you have is when your HAV switches modes, you want that mode to be stable, right? So you want to be able to stay in a particular mode uh, 
even in the presence of noise from uh, the surrounding air, from the propellers, from any kinds of vibrations on, on the structure itself. And so we ended up with this, uh, this bistable design. So when we 3D printed this structure, right, and put it on, um, onto a ring, I put it onto a boom in this case, I'm, and, and here's a video so you can see exactly how this structure behaves. Um, it does pretty well, actually, and we were really happy with the results of uh, this optimization process. So what you're seeing on the left is the physical design, the 3D printed version, and what you're seeing on the right is the simulated version. And so basically what's happening here is that the, the structure is accelerating and then rapidly decelerating. When it does that, then the inertia on the mass in the middle causes the structure uh, to switch states, right? And so the beam in this case that's in the middle, this, these uh, compliant beams that we 3D printed switch from uh, the left uh, stable state to a right stable state, right? And so we can use this, uh, this mechanism then in order to deploy wings. And so uh, recently, we basically attached these wings to the structure. The wings don't really do anything right now. They're just there for easier visualization, but we've shown that the structure is able to fly. And so here, when the robot is accelerating and then decelerating in the air, then again, <clears throat> the uh, beam switch state and then the wings deploy. So what you're seeing here is that the robot does lose a lot of altitude um, because the propellers are facing sideways, so they aren't able to pr uh, produce any kind of upward thrust. But we were able to show that this structure is able to use just inertial forces in order to switch state in a very dynamical scenario. Um, so what you're seeing here is tracking of the center platform, this, uh, this yellow line here. Um, is the displacement of the central platform compared to the rest of the vehicle. And so this we thought um, was really interesting because it's, as far as we know, um, the first time topology optimization has actually been applied to a dynamical system. And so we were really excited um, that this vehicle was actually able to transition. Now, you may notice that I um, paused the video in a very convenient location. So if I, if I continue playing this video, then immediately what happens is that the robot uh, goes unstable and it basically tumbles out of the sky. And the reason it does this, right, is because of assumptions that we made in the optimization problem. So it's clearer to see if I go back to this video here. What you're seeing is that um, on the right here, we have this uh, simulation, right? And one of the main assumptions that we made when we were optimizing this robot was that it was symmetric, right? Because that way we could simplify the problem by only optimizing one of these arms instead of all of them. But instead, what you're seeing is that um, because of gravity, the whole structure is tilted. Right, And so there are asymmetries in the robot that cause it not exactly to perform in the way that the optimizer expected. And further, because of fabrication uh, variations, there are minor differences in the four different arms that we placed onto this robot. And so what's happening when the robot transitions is that because of those asymmetries, basically there's a huge counter torque that is being applied to the robot, which causes it to rotate and then to tumble out of, um, out of the air, right? So what we're doing now on this project is trying to figure out a recovery mechanism. Uh, those of you who are really interested in uh, control problems, if you have any suggestions, we'd be really interested in hearing them. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we control these sorts of structures where the compliance gives you these extra capabilities, but it also adds um, large uh, modeling complexities and which lead to control complexities. But this also made us think 
um, about, you know, more carefully about how compliance can be designed into a system and when it makes sense to do that. So, um, and one of the, one of the uh, interesting things we found is that this is a discussion that also has been taking place for a really long time. So basically the issue with the system that I just showed you is that we can design the, the bistable beam in the middle, which allows the robot to change states. Mm -hmm. But the problem with getting this, this robot to fly controllably is interactions between that beam and the rest of the dynamical system, right? And so um, there's this really interesting pair of papers from the 1990s, which talk about this sort of problem <clears throat> where one, um, one person, Daniel Whitney was claiming that actually mechanical design is going to be very difficult to create a compi compiler for. It's not going to be anything like programming compilers or VLSI design because of this interdependency between parts, right? It's very difficult to modularize a mechanical design and say, well, if I know the model for one part and I know the model for another part, I can just combine them together, right? And so, um, and so the idea here was that, well, you know, this is, these are all interesting ideas, but actually it's, we're not really ever going to get a mechanical design compiler that works for complicated, more very complicated scenarios. But one year later, there was a, there was a response um, from Eric Antonsen who said, well, maybe, you know, in some very complicated scenarios, that's true, right? There's a lot of interdependency between different parts of your mechanical design, but there are scenarios in which case we can take in, there are scenarios that we can take advantage of modularity of, of a mechanical design. And maybe the key is not necessarily to think about, well, what is really, really hard about mechanical design, but rather to think about scenarios where we can actually take advantage of modularity. And so, like I said, we're still working on this HAV design and we're trying to think about, well, what are the additional constraints? What are the additional um, other types of design criteria that we need to incorporate into a pr an, into the optimization problem for something that complicated. But at the same time, we're also trying to think about the reverse approach, which is, well, if we want to create some sort of modularly, a modularly designed system, what are the types of systems where that sort of approach can succeed, right? And so one of the, uh, and so this basically brings us to, um, more deeply into this exploration of compliant mechanisms that uh, my group has been thinking about. And in particular, the idea of how we can combine compliant mechanisms in order to create some sort of design composition, right? So the idea behind design comp, well, before I continue, are there any questions? Okay, let me know if you have any questions. So in this space, the design behind a design composition is something like this. We have a library of designs, right? That we already have characterized. And each of these designs is associated with some sort of high level representation, which contains only the information required in order for us to create a new design, right? So now if I want to create a new design, and let's say in this case, I only care about kinematic structure, then I can take parts of this design, I can map it to parts that are in my design library, and then I can combine them together. And because each of the designs in my library is a real physically fabricatable part, then the new design can very quickly be transformed into also a fabricatable design, right? And so in this sort of approach, there are two big questions, right? One of the questions is, well, what exactly goes into this library? And then the second question is, well, how do we ensure that we can actually combine them together to satisfy whatever design criteria we have? Right. So for the first question, we've been thinking about, you know, what is the space of uh, designs 
that allow us to program their compliance, right? So that we can use them in a lot of different, in a lot of different compliant robots. <clears throat> and like I said, our group focuses very heavily on origami inspired design. And so we've been particularly thinking about this in the space of origami structures. And one of the ways we've been thinking about this problem is from the point of a view of, again, uh, of computational geometry. And so there's this interesting uh, theorem called the Bellows theorem, which says that the volume of a polyhedron with rigid faces is invariant under flexing. And why this is relevant to origami inspired design is that basically all origami structures, theoretically, if the paper was, was not stretchable, right, did not shear, basically locally the paper does not deform, right, then theoretically all of the faces are rigid. Which means that if you create some sort of bellow structure like what you see on the right, these sorts of structures, according to the Bellows theorem, are theoretically blocked, right? And so if you want to deform them, which physically you can, right? Physically you are able to compress these structures, then fundamentally the faces need to be able to flex, right? And so basically what that means is that from the point of view of design, we can look at how much these faces are deforming and we can do that uh, geometrically not necessarily using any kind of FEM simulation, right? But we can compute geometrically how much these faces need to deform in order to create this sort of motion. And we can use that in order to manipulate the stiffness of the structure. So what you're seeing at the bottom left here is the pattern and the associated 3D structure for this sort of design. These patterns are parameterized, right? And we can change the angles of particular folds in, in the pattern. And when we change, for example, this alpha angle, even by one degree, we get large changes in the stiffness of the structure and also large changes in the overall mechanical response, right? So one of my students got very interested this, by this idea, uh, Wei Shi Chen, um, decided to do a full characterization of this particular bellow structure and uh, looked at, well, how do changes in that angle alpha affect the overall stiffness of the design? How do changes in the layer structure, in this case, we're, if we double layer instead of a single layer of material, how does that affect the stiffness of the design? And he was able to show a wide range of stiffnesses that are achievable by this fold pattern, even with the exact same material, right? So all that's happening here is changes in the geometry of the structure. Not only that, but because we're relying on facial deformations, right? and those facial deformations are relatively small, these structures can actually survive for quite a long time. And so um, the way she uh, performed a cyclic test on an MTS machine, um, this allowed him to see how does the response of this bellow structure change over multiple cycles of compression. And you'll see that the first cycle looks a bit different. This is pretty standard for origami structures, but the structure very quickly converges to some um, this this blue cycle right here, which it maintains over over thousands of, of cycles, and so this made us believe that well, you are able to program the stiffness of this sort of origami pattern to a desired stiffness, right? And it's able to survive multiple repeated compressions and large forces. And so we should be able to use this for some sort of dynamical robot, which behaves uh, in a more interesting manner than, um, than the robots I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. And so Wei Shi took this spring design and he basically mounted it um, as the leg of a jumping robot. So what you're seeing here is uh, that exact same spring design in this case, designed to um, have a stiffness of, <clears throat> of um, about three newtons uh, per meter, three kilonewtons per meter, sorry. Um, and on top of this uh, robot is a large mass of motors, of batteries, um, basically everything that is required to actuate the system. And that entire load is being carried over repeated jumping by this 50 gram spring, origami spring. And so 
And, and this spring, like I said, the stiffness can be changed depending on what that load is. Not only that, but because these springs are compliant, then with very little change in the controller itself, we can get the same robot to jump over multiple different types of terrain. So here you're seeing the exact same robot moving over, you know, not just flat ground, but, um, but different environments. So what that means, or what we think it means, is that you can take, um, at least for this particular legged robot system, you can reduce the uh, design of the compliant component of the structure to a very simple design specification, which is just the stiffness. And in this case, you can design that independently from the rest of the robot. Not only that, but here's an example of just one single hop with the exact same structure. We can change the amount of energy that's stored in the design, which results in a change in jump height here, simply by changing the geometry, right? So we don't have to change anything about the controller. We don't have to change anything about the materials that are being used. We don't have to change anything about the electronics or the actuation, right? In this case, if we just change a single fold angle in this design, we can change the jump height, which is, you know, which maps to the energy storage by um, almost 25%. And so this particular demonstration we thought gave a lot of promise for building a database of modules that we could use for more complicated designs. And so starting from this idea, we've, we've built this, um, this library of modules, um, which allow us to get uh, translational motion, which is this linear compression you just saw in the previous demo, but we can also get rotation with programmable compliance, um, twisting, Etc. And so what we are working on now is thinking about, well, how do we then uh, show that we can combine these modules into kinematic structures with arbitrary complexity and desired compliance uh, responses, right? And so basically the, I, the question here then is if we want to use these modules in order to computationally design some sort of robot, then we need to solve this composition problem. So when we were thinking about this problem, we decided, well, let's keep things simple for now. Um, the idea that we've basically reduced this whole problem down to is how do we design compliance into a particular kinematic chain, right? So I'm gonna strip out the dynamical part of the robot right now and just focus on the compliance specification. And I'm gonna focus in this case, just to make things a little bit easier on a serial manipulator, which we can describe using a very standard representation, DH representation, right? So we don't need to worry about how to specify the robot at all, that it all exists, right? And so the problem then that we need to solve for this, this compositional approach is given a DH specification of a serial robot that has with a particular um, desired net compliance, how do we construct a crease pattern to be kinematically equivalent to the desired one, right? And the main insight that we had for this approach was that when you have this sort of specification, the DH specification dictates the locations of all of the joints, but only up to a translation, right? So all of your degrees of freedom are known and they're precisely that placed, but the joints can be anywhere along the axis of motion for whatever design it is that you're trying to create. And so what that means is that we can use this extra degree of freedom in order to design a crease pattern that corresponds to the desired DH specification. And we can do that in polynomial time because, um, because, because we have this extra degree of freedom. Not only that, but because our library of modules consists of modules with programmable stiffness, we can take advantage of different parameters in those modules that don't affect the degrees of freedom at all. They just change the stiffness to design the overall compliance of, in this case, the manipulator arm. And so, um, and so we were able to do this. And in particular, what we thought was really interesting is that we were able to map this problem onto the Dubin's path planning, planning problem, which means that if you are trying to design an arbitrary uh, Kin serial 
manipulator. Um, if you can solve the Dubin's path planning problem in 3D, then you can also design your robot. So if you're interested in this algorithm, that's online. Um, it's been posted on GitHub. And I'll give you a quick overview of what that looks like right now. Basically, if you have two joints that you want to connect together, then we can create a Dubin's path that uh, connects the frames uh, at, at the ends of those two joints, right? And each component of this path can be mapped to a module in the database. So like I said, we have modules for rotation and translation and twisting, and each of those maps onto a particular portion of this Dubin's path. What that means is that if you have multiple joints or multiple degrees of freedom that you want to have in your serial manipulator, you basically just need to be able to ensure that this Dubin's path exists, right? And so what we know from computational geometry and many decades of work in this space is that that Dubin's path can exist as long as the joints are at least a, de a desired, a particular distance apart, in this case, 4R, where R is the radius of um, the curved part of your, of your path. Right. And so essentially what we have now is if you have particular uh, structure that you're trying to construct, then we can take advantage of the extra degree of freedom in the joint locations in order to move the joints to be 4R apart. And then we can, just, uh, we can solve the Dubin's path planning problem in order to connect all of the joints to each other. This gives us a particular kinematic chain, which can be converted into an origami pattern and furthermore, the chain is guaranteed not to self-intersect and it has the, the correct degrees of freedom. So if I fold this pattern here, which you see on the right, then that corresponds to um, this fold pattern here. And what you're seeing are modules in exactly the locations of, of where the joints should be connected by these uh, tubular crease patterns that basically enforce um, the locations of the joints relative to each other. So this is basically now um, an end-to-end -end approach from taking a desired, uh, uh, taking a specification for a manipulator arm with a desired compliance and directly converting it into an origami pattern. Of course, we've made certain assumptions in, or we've put certain restrictions on the algorithm in order to ensure that there's no self-collision in any case, which makes the design a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. So if we wanted to convert a Puma arm into the equivalent origami compliant structure, then the algorithm outputs something like this. Um, in most cases, uh, self-collision is, is actually pretty rare. And so we can drop some of those constraints and get a structure that's a little bit more compact. And what's nice is that because we've basically reduced the problem into uh, one of solving a Dubin's path planning problem, um, you can also ask a human to come in and try to optimize the structure a little bit. And if the human designs the structure, then you end up with a very compact uh, design that looks like this, where the black lines again are the links, and then the, the colored spheres are the joint locations, which then you can convert directly into a fold pattern like this, which is a compliant um, origami structure. So what we think this means is that in the future, as we're looking ahead, we can, for some situations, think about um, mechanically designing a robot, a dynamical robot, by taking advantage of part modularity. So if we have these kinematic chains with desired compliance, we have certain behavioral requirements for a robot, we can figure out how those behavioral uh, requirements map onto a mechanical structure by thinking about like what is what is the required control look like. That mechanical structure is going to interact with an external environment that provides some sort of uh, requirements on the, the stiffness of the structure. And together those create, you know, the, a design, the, the behavior of the robot in the environment. If we want to figure out then what goes inside of this yellow box, the mechanical uh, component, then from a compositional design approach, this basically uh, consists of choosing the parts, choosing the degrees of freedom 
choosing the mechanical properties associated with what kind of behavior we want to create, and then choosing the geometries that generate those sorts of mechanical properties, and then composing the designs. And we think that we can do this um, by expanding on these sorts of ideas that I just showed you here. So um, that's a quick overview of the two different um, ideas that we've been taking um, to try to approach this question of how do we design uh, computationally more interesting, more complicated, more capable robots. Um, I'll conclude by showing you a couple of the different areas that we're moving to now in the future. So one of the things that I showed that I said before was that um, we're very interested in origami inspired fabrication. And one of the questions that I haven't answered in any of this discussion is how we think about the actuation, the sensing, right? And so one of the things that uh, my group has been working on is these fabrication approaches for creating basically foldable um, PCBs, right? Which allow us to directly embed electronics, actuators, sensors into the body of the robot and have them um, have their locations and uh, have their locations adjust along with any kind of shape changes that the robot has. So as part of our next steps, we've been starting to think about, well, how does then the actuation interact with the physical structure of the robot in order to create the behaviors that are desired, but also in order to feed back what are behavioral requirements. So my student Dongsheng has been thinking about this problem. And basically what it comes down to is that if you have a dynamical robot, unlike a quasi-static system, then that creates certain force and velocity requirements on the actuators in your system which, you know, if you have a database of them, you can pull those actuators uh, from, from your database. However, adding particular actuators and associated power, electronic sensors, et cetera, adds mass to your system, which changes its dynamics, right? And we kind of saw this already in the HAB example. And so what you actually need to do is as an iterative design process that takes into account the effect of the electronics on the robot design, and then the other direction, the effect of the robot design on the required electronics. And so Dongsha has basically been working on this idea of how do we um, think about interactions between these two subsystems, not just now the compliance of the robot itself, but how does the dynamical motion of the robot affect actuator and sensing requirements and working on this sort of iterative approach to design. In addition, we've been thinking about, well, how do we actually specify the task um, and think about you know, what are the actual requirements on the robot's motion and what we want to say, uh, what we want to be able to say about uh, its energetic efficiency or about its performance. So very quickly, this is another system that we've been thinking about. Um, this is an underwater robot. And I'm sure very quickly, you all will know that this robot has even a lot more interactions associated or a, a lot more uh, complex uh, modeling associated with it than the legged robot that I showed you before. All right, so in this case, this robot is basically compressing and then expanding in order to create a jet that propels itself forward. And the efficiency of this robot and its ability to create this motion depends not only on the stiffness of the robot's skin, but also its interaction with the surrounding fluid, right? And so there's a really interesting question here, which is, well, in this case, I could try to modularize the system and say, well, how do I separate the fluid dynamics from the required stiffness of the robot itself and try to, and then, you know, take this compositional design approach of designing the skin and then thinking about the fluid dynamics. And the question that we're trying to figure out is in what cases does it make sense to do that? And in what cases do we really have to specify, you know, the full, the fully integrated robot design? So in order to figure out this question, we're trying to think about this computationally, but we're also um, 
trying to understand how humans approach this process. And so um, basically we're taking the software that I showed you at the beginning and running a whole bunch of user studies in order to figure out, well, how do humans approach the, the process of designing, in this case, a legged robot? And can we look at, how, at their thought processes in order to understand when humans modularize and when they think about uh, subsystems of the robot together um, to understand uh, more, uh, how we might be able to approach these ideas uh, better in the future. So um, yeah, so that's basically the work that our group has been doing. Um, all of this work has been done by uh, the students in my group. Um, the ones whose work I showed here are highlighted in green. Um, yeah, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Cynthia, for the great talk. Many interesting uh, insights. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Hey, Cynthia, uh, it's a very, very interesting talk. Uh, thank you. Um, one question that I had is, uh, what are the consequences of the assumption that you make that you want to build this thing, build, you know, leveraging in this origami structure? Sure, the consequences of using origami. Right. So, um, so that is a question that we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what are, what are the limits of origami structures. So basically, um, one, one consequence is that your 3D design, whatever it is you, you want to create, needs to map to a 2D structure, right? So that's just, that just adds complexity to the design uh, approach where you need to either figure out how you can lay out your 3D structure as one sheet or how to cut up your sheets and connect them together in order to make whatever 3D structure it is you want to fold. Right, so that's a, that's a geometric um, problem. We're trying to understand right now as well whether there are just mechanical limitations. So what I showed you um, with the, the legged robot was an exploration where we were really trying to figure out, you know, are there, are, are origami structures just fundamentally limited in what kind of loads? they can carry. And we think that, um, or at, at least we were able to demonstrate that they're, they're able to carry kilograms, right? So practically, um, we haven't hit the limits yet in terms of the mechanical capabilities of origami structures. On the theoretical side, um, we've been working on scaling laws to understand if you have a shell structure, that's an origami structure versus a solid structure that maybe you would machine, are there certain limitations in terms of how large you can scale these designs? And um, origami structures and solid structures do scale differently. And that's a work in progress, but hopefully we'll have an answer to that question soon. How about things that, um, you know, these are mechanical properties, but perhaps are harder to state, right? I'm thinking about um, fatigue. Yep. Um, you know, essentially you are, rely I mean, the origami structure relies on bending, right? So like uh, stretching, but also a lot of bending at the edges between the faces, right? Yes. Uh, which may not be friendly for many <laughs> materials, right? Uh, sure, sure. Yes. So I will say. Um, the properties so this... you can include, uh, you know, for example, like minimize the amount of, you know, flexing back and forth, you know, things like that. Yes. So basically, what, what, um, if, so, so there are two ways that you can control the stiffness of an origami structure, right? One is if you rely on, uh, stiffness in the folds, then it really comes down to the material property because you're basically bending the material over and over again with a very sharp or with a very small uh, radius of, of bending, mm -hmm. right? And that definitely causes right. <laughs> uh, fatigue and it causes everything to rip. And that is why when many of the first origami robots 
frankly did not actually do that much, right? Because they lasted, a, you know, maybe a dozen cycles and then they ripped and then they fell apart. Um, what the, so the structure that we've been exploring relies less on fold deformations and more on face deformations, mm. right? So in this case, if you localize all of your bending in the faces instead, then you can um, distribute the stress through the material better. Mm -hmm. And you end up with structures that last, you know, thousands of cycles. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually haven't had any of these origami structures break on us yet. Um, that doesn't mean they won't eventually, um, mm -hmm. but they haven't. And the way that we typically think about them is that it's kind of like metal springs, right? Like metal springs, you have a coil structure. And at the end of the day, when you compress that spring, you're also bending and deforming that metal spring. But because it's in a coil structure, the local deformation is much smaller than if you were just if you weren't in a coil design, right? And so that's the same sort of idea that we're applying here. So is there a way that, for example, you can impose that you stay within the limits of, say, elastic deformation, right? And you don't yep. uh, get into, you know. Yeah, for sure. So basically, the amount by which you need to deform the face it affects the total amount of deformation you can get from the structure, but also the stiffness, right? And so if you're trying, if you want a stiffer structure, then you need to, you know, create larger deformations, typically, um, if you use the same material, right? So it, it's a balance. Okay, thanks. From... Any other question? Maybe I have one uh, actually connected to what Emilio just asked. Um, and I, I, so it's more related to the part of uh, where you were showing this uh, uh, path planning analogy. Mm -hmm. uh, my question was, how do, does the solution of this problem uh, cope with the choice of actual controllers or actuation? So I, I understand this is part of the next steps, but clearly, one thing is having the design, one thing is how you will use it, right? Uh, in, the, in the practical case. And therefore also the, all these mechanical properties will play a different role depending on the aggressivity, for instance, you will yeah. have when you control these things. So how do, they, do, how do you plan on, on mixing the two things? Sure, so all of, the sh all of the modules that I showed you in this presentation are actually hollow. And so, our strategy so far has been to mount the actuation on the inside. And so, uh, and use uh, tendons in order to drive the joints. And so in that case, the, there, the, the size or you know, the shape of the actuator doesn't interfere too much with the design other than adding mass. Um, so the, uh, the, the last uh, part that I showed you about trying to understand how actuators interact with the robot design has really been focused on mass distribution and not so much on how, how the mounting of the actuator onto the structure may interfere with the structure's you know, basic properties. Um, but you know, it could be interesting to think about that uh, especially as we start to think about, you know, other types of driving mechanisms, right? So if we can't use tendons, we need to do direct drive or something, then definitely the motor is going to interfere with the basic origami structure's performance. Okay, I see. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, any question? Any other question? I think. Uh, yeah. I have a question uh, about the materials. Uh, it looks very seem that uh, uh, this material is plastic or some other things. Yes, so in this case, um, we use a variety of materials. The one you're seeing here is a combination of cardboard in the middle and then PET, so just plastic film on the outside. We've done the same experiments with just straight PET. We've also used PTFE um, and even spring steel sheets. So the ideas that I was talking about extend to multiple different materials. Basically, you just get a scaling of the stiffness, um, but the geometric changes create the same, same effects. Yeah. 
I think the materials will uh, influence the structure. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of factors you need to consider when you design the uh, actuator, such as the size and the the size and the the the, the shape, and also the amount of the uh, each unit. Uh, also the materials. Uh, I want to know how do you make the optimization, uh, or yeah, it is a very difficult part. Sure. So actuation. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to like what is the robot actually doing, right? So if, if the robot needs to execute a certain motion, then you have a certain force requirement, a certain velocity requirement, which maps onto, a, in our case, a particular DC motor. Of course, if you're considering other types of um, actuators, then they map, maybe, maybe you have a different specification. But in our case, we just map them onto the requirements for a DC motor. So that DC motor is going to have a volume, it's gonna have a mass, it's gonna have um, certain voltage current requirements, right? And so, yes, it does impact the rest of the design. And so from the actuation side, we've been thinking about, well, just the mass, um, like I was mentioning before, although, um, and you know, the other, other stuff is more complicated and we need to think about it in the future. How that affects the material choice though is, an, is also an interesting question because if you add mass, then you might end up with larger fatigue issues, right? Which is what Amelia was talking about. And so our approach to that has been trying to um, put as much of the deformation in the structure into the faces as possible instead of the folds to reduce the possibility of fatigue, right? That doesn't mean that fatigue doesn't happen, right? It just means that the effect is lower. And so at some point you are going to need to change the material um, and and so, you know, different materials produce different stiffness ranges, right? And so uh, basically the way we've been thinking about it is you have your robot, it has certain actuation, certain equations of motion that you're trying to satisfy that creates sort of certain stiffness specification. And then within the different materials that we've been able to use, given the range of stiffnesses that it's able to achieve, how do we map that stiffness distribution onto a particular material that is easy for us to manufacture in the lab, but also the associated set of geometric parameters. Does that make sense? Okay, I see. And another question is, uh, do you make the fabrication by your own lab bar? Yes. Yes, oh, we do everything in house. Okay, therefore, I think, uh, do you the such as when you uh, close the structure, do you use the heat saving method or some other method? For what? Uh, for such as close the plastic part. I think it oh. is the, a whole part looks very nice, yeah. Yes, um, so yes. So there are different ways that we seal. It really depends on what's most convenient at the time. Um, so the easiest thing to do is to just, you know, cut a slit and then we just kind of slot them together. Um, they're in some cases, like this picture that you're seeing here is held together by glue. Um, but when we're trying to make something that is sealed together really well, yes, we do heat seal. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, you look very nice. Because I, I also work for the South Robotics before and uh, they are using some, uh, it is a kind of hazels by Christoph group. Mm. And we, we are using the uh, also plastic, but we, we, we need to inject the, the oil. Therefore, the way that you how to close the how to close the plastic is very important for the performance of the hazels. Yeah, yeah we definitely had that issue on the underwater robot um, where certain adhesives just did not stick when we put the robot underwater. And so finding the right glue for us in that robot was really important. Um, and so that one is a mix of gluing and heat sealing. Okay, thank you, Fang. So thank you very much. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. No Great, so maybe a final question that we have posted in the chat is from Barnabas, who says, in our lab, we are interested in applying task-specific design to soft robotics. And uh, the curiosity is to hear your thoughts on representations 
where the characteristics are not lumped, for instance, continuum robotic. Sure. Um, so that's actually where we started with the topology optimization stuff, right? And, and why, and one of the reasons why we're still continuing that vein of work um, to try to understand, you know, if there is a continuum or if there's just like a block of material where it isn't necessarily, you, you, you can't necessarily, you know, lump particular parts of that material together than what do we do, right? And so, um, so one representation you can use is just, you know, voxelized material block. I'm still not sure whether or not that's the right thing to do um, for the purposes of optimization, right? Um, I think there are certain situations in which doing that is probably required, right? Um, because you do need to be able to specify the material at the voxel level. Um, but in some cases it's not. And so that's not, I mean, that's not, I don't have a good answer for you. I can say that that's the question that we're trying to figure out is for particular tasks, what is the level at which you can modularize the design, right? Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, so I don't have a good answer for you, unfortunately. But I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Cynthia. I think, yeah, Barnabas will write in the chat if, if it's <laughs> satisfactory, I think. So uh, I wanted to thank you again for the great talk. Uh, as you see, you created a lot of discussions uh, and wish you good luck for the next steps. Um, and thank you all for participating and uh, see you all to the next week for the next autonomy talk. All right, thank you very much.